Uh, good morning. I'm Alan Weil. I'm Editor-in-Chief of Health Affairs. We're the leading health policy journal in the country. We're happy to have you all with us this morning. Well, it was bound to happen. Um, I've been moderating sessions at uh, Spotlight Health and now Ideas Health for five years. And finally, I'm moderating in the ballroom of the Hotel Jerome. Um, I was married in this room 19 years ago. Um, now, I will confess the room has weathered the 19 years better than my marriage, but that's not what you came to hear about. Um, what you came to <laughs> I wasn't sure if that was going to work, but I. <laughs> uh, you didn't come to hear about that. You came to hear about is immortality the goal. And I do want to say at the outset, if you came thinking that an hour from now you are going to know how to be immortal, um, you're not in the right room. That's actually not quite the conversation we're going to have. We, I discussed that with my panelists. Um, we're going to talk about what's happening and what's, uh, what our potential is. Uh, in the last century, uh, life expectancy in the United States and other developed countries up 30 years, which is a phenomenal change. Uh, we've actually largely narrowed the, the racial gaps in longevity, although they're still significant, and there are pockets where they're quite large, but it's narrower than it was 20, 30 years ago. Um, the question isn't just how long we're going to live, but it's how we're going to live as we live longer, and that's really the topic for today. So we can ask the question if immortality is the goal, but we can also ask the question, how is it that we're going to use the extra years of life that are a gift that we have now that we just didn't have uh, not so many years ago. Um, you're going to hear from Susan Golden, who's the director of DCIX at Stanford, uh, Jay Olshansky, who's a professor in uh, the School of Public Health at the University of Illinois Chicago. You have more complete biographies in the materials and in the apps. Uh, but why don't I start by turning it over to Jay, who's written a piece to talk about sort of the framing of, of this issue so that we're not just thinking about immortality. Thank you. And first of all, um, absolutely delighted to be here. And uh, congratulations to the Aspen Institute for creating this type of setting. And it's just a complete coincidence, by the way, that the two of us are dressed up as black and white, as if there's some sort of, you know, um, it, was, it was a coincidence. I'm uh, an optimist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you might actually come to the conclusion that she's the optimist and I'm the <laughs> pessimist. Uh, but but we'll, we'll see how that works out after, after an hour. Um, so what the article he's referring to is a piece that I published in uh, the Journal of the, of the American Medical Association last November. The title was From Lifespan to Healthspan. It was basically an argument that, that the time has arrived in our modern era to stop trying to make us live longer uh, and instead just focus in on health extension rather than life extension. The way to understand the logic and the rationale behind this, I'm just going to tell you a very brief story using the analogy of uh, Goethe's Faust. Do you know the story of Faust? 18th century uh, character and intellectual who becomes disillusioned with life, <clears throat> um, is about to commit suicide, and is approached by the devil Mephistopheles. Mephistopheles comes up to Faust and says, in exchange for your soul, I'll give you a much, much longer uh, and healthier life. Uh, Faust says, OK, where do I sign? signs the papers, uh, and you know, this story of Faust has, of course, manifested itself in many stories over the centuries. And the area of, uh, of longevity fits with this story of Faust perfectly. Mephistopheles came to us in 1850 and said, I've got a deal for you. Back then, life expectancy in most places in the world was about 45 to 50, high infant and child mortality. Uh, we were losing our children. That's one of the reasons, that's the re main reason why life expectancy was so low. The devil said, I've got a deal for you. I'm going to allow you to uh, add 30 years to life. I'm going to save your children. You're going to get to live longer as a result. You'll get an additional 30 years, a gift. <clears throat> if you were in 1850 and I was in 1850 and the devil came to me with that deal, I'd say, where do I sign? Really good deal. Save the children. Let's all have an opportunity to live a long life. It worked. Uh, we got 30 years of life. We reduced infant, child, and maternal mortality. Uh, but the price we had to pay in typical Faustian fashion is, you know, there's always a price. 
uh, for this, and the price was the rise of heart disease, cancer, stroke, Alzheimer's, osteoporosis, osteoarthritis, everything that we associate with aging and growing old. It's what happens to aging bodies. The devil has now come back to us again. Mephistopheles is right in front of us right now, saying, I've got another deal for you. And the deal is, I'm going to allow you to make progress against the major fatal diseases that I gave you 150 years ago uh, in exchange for the added 30 years. I'm going to allow you to reduce the risk of death from heart disease, cancer, stroke, a broad range of, of fatal conditions. Um, and, but the price is, is that the, you're going to get incrementally smaller, smaller, and smaller gains in, in longevity. Uh, and you're going to get an additional thirst for more and more life. We are now at the point where we have to make this decision on whether we want to sign these papers uh, and accept this disease-specific approach to uh, going forward. And I am suggesting, and I suggested in that JAMA article, that no, we should not be signing this contract. This is not a good deal. We should not be focusing in only on one disease at a time. Instead, we should be focusing in on a systemic approach to going after the things that are associated with growing older by slowing the biological process of aging. And I'm suggesting that that is the opportunity that stands before us today. And I'm extremely optimistic. Uh, so I'm using that word. I'm extremely optimistic that this, the science has now caught up with the idea that we can modify our own biology and slow down the rate of biological aging not for the purpose of making us live longer, but for the purpose of extending the period of healthy life. And I'm very excited at that, that prospect. I believe it will happen uh, in our lifetime. The science has really advanced quite rapidly, including by scientists at Stanford and elsewhere. Um, and you'll hear, I'm sure we'll talk more about that uh, during the course of the hour. So I'm going to stop there, and you can hear an another part of the Excellent. story here. So uh, Susan, um, if we're going to extend the lifespan, I'm sorry, the health span, I'll, I'll get this wrong just like immortality and mortality a few times this morning. If we're going to extend the health span, we have a healthcare system, we have a biomedical enterprise, we have delivery systems all built over decades that have inherited historical perspectives on what kind of research we should do, how we should deliver care. What changes do we need to make in healthcare, the healthcare enterprise, research, delivery, organization, uh, to give us a longer health span, not just a longer lifespan? We need to be uh, thinking about how you're going to live a longer life from early childhood. It's not something you begin at 50 or 60. It's something that has to be incorporated into children's lives in terms of exercise, nutrition, and one of the surprising new findings is uh, there's a tremendous rise in nearsightedness in children. And this is because they're, not, they're spending a lot of time on screens, and they're not getting outside where you do long distance vision. Um, those, those kinds of problems will lead to some of the uh, aging problems associated with the eye. This is preventable. Uh, there are interventions that could be put in place. You could imagine that schools would have to become involved, pediatricians would have to become involved, but that's where it, where it begins. Um, it's a long life, and how do we take advantage of this long life? Well, first, as you said, we have to invest in the health span. Our medical, medical system in this country, unfortunately, is not set up to do that yet. There's a real movement going on right now in Medicare with Medicare Advantage programs that are really looking at value-based care, but we need to bring that in from the ver very beginning to all cohorts. That will make a huge difference. Another component is we know that there are sort of three factors that create healthy lives. And it, they might not be the typical ones that you know about, but they're purpose, community, and wellness. Wellness is talked about quite a bit, but there aren't financial incentives put in place always for wellness. And we could imagine programmings that would um, incentivize people to participate in wellness programs where you pay for somebody's membership and uh, community-based programming. That would make an enormous difference in getting people involved. Related to that is purpose. You, we, it, there have been sufficient studies to say that if you don't have purpose, and, and it will change over a course of a long life, 
but it's helping people uh, understand what that is, and that might mean changes in your educational opportunities to, to reinvent and rethink what you want to do in different chapters. And there is no way the current educational system, which currently ends after a four-year college education as the ambition, can last you for a 100-year life. So we're, whereas people used to retire in their 50s and 60s, that's something that needs to absolutely change. People need to rethink what they want to do. They may have to retool at different stages of their life. And the last component, but I think it's actually the most important one, is community. People are increasingly becoming more isolated. And there's been a tremendous amount of research done to now identify loneliness as a, as a public health problem in this country and in others. Um, studies have shown that a third of people over 45 uh, describe themselves as lonely. Not people 65, 75, 85, beginning at 45. And in the UK, they have put a minister uh, in place to tackle this problem with over 20 uh, million pounds invested to come up with n novel ways with the medical system, with the uh, public service systems to address and tackle loneliness. You may see it in your own communities, but identifying communities at different stages of life and, and engaging in them will make a gigantic difference. Uh, the, the common phrase right now is um, loneliness is equal to smoking um, 15 cigarettes a day in terms of the health consequences. So when we look at the, our healthcare system, we have to start looking at the social determinants of health. People are increasingly doing it. There's some really interesting new uh, innovations and in companies focused on this area. But it's not the traditional system that we had that took us to average life of expectancy of 64. That is not the average life expectancy anymore. So all the systems have to change from education, work, uh, health, and retirement. All have to be um, factored in to this new life. And we have to reimagine a new course of life that's no longer the three-stage of life, but a multi-stage life where people go in and out of the different stages. So before we go deeper into these social phenomena and the role of the healthcare system in them, I want to stay a little bit on the medical side. And Jay, you, you mentioned the Faustian bargain uh, being the, the proliferation of a lot of new diseases. And when I think about the biomedical enterprise and when I think about how we treat people in the healthcare system, it's very much disease by disease. We cure you of one thing, and as, uh, as you live longer, the odds that if we cure you of one thing, you're going to die of something else go up. But then you mentioned this notion of slowing the progression of aging. So I guess from a medical perspective, are we talking, when we're looking to extend the health span, are we talking about progressively improving our detection and treatment and potentially cure of these diseases? Or are we talking about something sort of that, that is foundational that's more like what you described in terms of slowing the underlying aging processes? Yeah, so look, our physicians are doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing. If you've got a health issue, if you've got a problem with your heart, you've got a, a, a you have cancer, you go to an oncologist, you, you go to a heart specialist, they fix you. Uh, that's what they're supposed to be doing. They push you out the door and you live your life until the next thing comes along. Uh, and, and then you go back to a physician, they fix you, they push you back out the door. This is supposed to happen. That's not going to change and I don't want it to change. If I've got a problem you know, with any one of these body parts, I want my doctor to, to fix it. The, the problem is, is that the, the physicians, in doing what they're supposed to be doing, they don't look at the big picture. They're not supposed to look at the big picture. We're supposed to look at the big picture. So what happens is, is they push you out the door, and the time period between when you experience a health event and the next one shortens the longer you live. Now, I've referred to this, and, and in the JAMA article, I have a, an image that explains what we've done to ourselves. So we've pushed out longevity and survival well into what I refer to the, as the red zone, a time period roughly after the age of 65, where the risk of frailty and disability rises exponentially. The further you survive into the red zone, the higher the risk that frailty and disability will appear, the shorter the time frame between these diseases appearing. In epidemiology, this is called competing risks. It's a well-known phenomenon. Uh, and therein lies the danger. Uh, 
if we continue with this particular approach only, this disease-specific approach, we will succeed in pushing people deeper and deeper into the red zone where frailty and disability is extraordinarily high. But the price we're going to have to pay is an, uh, an elevation in the risk, uh, elevation of frailty and disability. Now, keep in mind, if we cure cancer, and don't get me wrong, I, I'd like to see a cure for cancer. We would only increase life expectancy for the population by about three and a half years. But more importantly, we would likely see a dramatic escalation in the uh, prevalence and severity of Alzheimer's disease. We are going to trade off one set of diseases for another. This is the Faustian bargain that's in front of us today. And it's precisely the reason why I think we need to change our model. And while the, you know, your physicians aren't going to do anything different, those of us that are doing research in this area need to get away from this you know, isolated, siloed approach to going after the things that go wrong with us as we grow old. This is how the NIH is constructed based on these silos. You, know, you have a heart uh, institute here and a cancer institute here and Alzheimer's over here. And they don't, until recently, they haven't really talked to each other. And the underlying risk factor for all of these things that are going wrong with us is this basic biological process of aging that's happening, march, that's marching on uninfluenced by cures for anything. You cure heart disease, you cure cancer, you cure stroke, aging marches on. So unless you find a way to alter that fundamental biological process, I fear we are moving in a direction of increased frailty and disability, uh, a, a worsening of Alzheimer's disease. That's the one thing that scares me the most because we can replace you know, our knees and our hips and our shoulders. There's things that we can replace. The brain is our Achilles heel. And I don't see us replacing that anytime, so we, anytime soon. We had this discussion yesterday. Well, I've been, I, I'm moderating an artificial intelligence session later today, so maybe we actually will. Yeah. I, hope, I hope so. Um, Susan, you describe the move to value-based care. I heard you describe it in the context of these determinants of purpose, community, and wellness. I wonder if there's also, given uh, the, the narrowness of, of the clinical model, if there's a role in value-based care in promoting looking at the big picture, as Jay described, if it's not the job of the individual clinician, he says it's us, but we aren't all always so good at that. Right. So how do we get the big picture in that context? So people are um, experimenting with a new concept called navigators. And it's, it's in a way that every person might have a health advocate navigating the system with them. Um, we're seeing that in Medicare right now, in Medicare Advantage programs. And I can imagine that's something that could begin in the very beginning. It, each time your child or you might have a condition, you're on, on the internet and you're trying to become an expert in something, but then it leads to something else. Just what you were saying, that you know, the, the, it would be better if we had primary care physicians as our navigators and if we enhance the role of the pedi our primary care providers. In England, primary care providers and geriatricians are paid more than specialists. That's a good idea. That's, that's putting prevention up front and embedded into the system. And that is something we can change, even our, in our complicated medical care system that we currently have in the United States. But if we, we've demonstrated that that can help, having somebody navigate the system with you who's informed. Um, many of you may have experienced concierge medicine at different times. It makes a huge difference. You have somebody who understands the complexity of it. So what if we could democratize concierge medicine into primary care? It would be a, a, a huge advantage to all who are going to have this long life and want to keep the health span as long as possible. And there are many things that are preventable. A good part of heart disease is preventable. We know that. Smoking, what you eat, what you exercise, how you exercise, where you exercise. That, that's a known. We could integrate that really early on. So you can imagine Girl Scout badges for doing you know, your exercise that day, that it becomes just part of the culture. And it is part of the culture in many other countries. We can look to um, some of the Scandinavian countries who've done remarkable things uh, in terms of prevention in that regard. Um, so I think it's possible, but I think we have to make changes. Our current system is not built for this. And 
uh, we need to be advocates for it, basically. I think there needs to be a movement, people demanding that they want a navigator along their 100-year life. So as you describe those functions, I can't help but think about your earlier comment that a healthy lifespan begins in early childhood. We live in a country with huge disparities in early childhood experience, exposure to stressors, that we have a new understanding of the lifetime effects that those have, availability of the resources that allow you to have a healthy community and, and, and pursue wellness. Um, concierge medicine is not a term that we tend to associate with low and moderate income folks. We think of that as something you buy if you can afford it. So for both of you, I'd, I'd like to try to map the question of extending the health span with the practical reality that we have these tremendous disparities and how do we not let the move to extending the health span just be another form of uh, you know, the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer uh, as, as new opportunities open up for those who have the resources and those who don't just uh, have to do without. I think one of the solutions, and, and it might not be obvious, but we, we're living in very segregated communities, age segregated communities. And I think if we uh, create more opportunities for intergenerational living, um, both co-housing, community centers, that will make a major shift in how people are navigating this, this process, both low income, high income, any income. Um, if communities become more t tightly entwined by different generations and different ages, I think that is a, a low cost solution that could have tremendous benefit. We're, we're seeing some, some novel uh, efforts in that way, but it should be everywhere um, in every community and you could have uh, local municipalities working on this and this is not a high cost solution, it's actually rather a low cost solution. It's one that I think of going forward. So if I can inject a dose of reality on this issue of of disparities. Um, so look, uh, if I could show you the, what death looks like in, a, in an image, it's, it sort of takes a J-shaped curve, right? High early age mortality declines to its lowest point at puberty, rises exponentially thereafter. This has been known for 200 years. This trajectory has never changed in humans, ever. Uh, the risk of death has gone down, but the age trajectory has always looked exactly the same anywhere you go, anywhere in the world, and you see the exact same phenomenon for different species. So this is built into our biology. Uh, all of public health is disparities. Um, I mean, look, that's what we, we look at are subgroups of the population. Some are doing better, some are doing worse. Um, disparities will never go away. It's built into our biology. Some are destined to live to die early because of inherent uh, a genetic propensity for certain diseases, that's not, that's not going to stop. Um, there's a random or stochastic component to aging that will not go away. Uh, you know, you can live a perfectly healthy lifestyle and still face health issues in your 30s. You can have atrocious lifestyles um, at some level, like Jean Calmon. Remember, this is the woman who lived to 122. She smoked for 100 years. Um, as I tell my students, this is not a license to smoke. It just tells you that some people don't have smoking as a risk factor for them. So disparities will never go away. That should not stop us from advancing science to help us live healthier longer. When a breakthrough comes forth in aging biology, it will not be equitably distributed, just like anything else of value. I, I, I wish I could say otherwise, but it's likely to be expensive depending on what it is, if it's a, you know, metformin. I don't know if anyone here is taking metformin uh, for diabetes, but um, if this happens to be a compound that works, that's very cheap. That could actually be distributed uh, widely. But if it's another type of intervention, it's not gonna be cheap. It will be inequitably distributed like any other valuable commodity. It should not stop us from do doing this work. Um, so, so I'm... I'm, I'm not, I wouldn't suggest that it should stop us from doing the work, but I guess I want to push back a little bit. Um, certainly some disparities are random, but there are also disparities that are systematic. Nope. And so to sort of say, well, because disparities exist, 
uh, we, we just sort of have to accept that seems to ignore the portions that are non-random. Yeah, no, agreed. So we have to accept some level of, of disparity. There's no question that uh, reducing the obvious sources of disparity, uh, income, education, education in particular, is one of the most powerful forces uh, to influence health and quality of life going forward. It's extraordinary. Um, in its ability to influence these variables. These are, are things, uh, income inequality, access to healthcare. So the, this is the low hanging fruit. There's no question we should be going after that. Um, and that will reduce the disparities somewhat. They, even if we succeed, the disparities will still be there. Um, Susan, you mentioned some you know, relatively low cost models, but let's talk more broadly about the social response necessary to handle a longer lifespan and keep it healthy. And you, you alluded to some of these things in your first comments about purpose, community, and wellness. But I mean, at some level, you can imagine completely redesigning living and transportation. Uh, you talked about changing education and employment. H how do we get our heads around this? I mean, it, it, the, the, the scale of change necessary to accommodate the reality that as people age, if we want them to be healthy, and if they are healthy, there's still a lot of other things that change that we need to be responsive to. So how, how, do, we, how do we start thinking I mean, about that? You're right, it, it is a huge topic. I mean, the whole field of longevity is life in all aspects of it. I mean, so you have to sort of slice it. I, I think one topic that requires greater attention is work. People should not need to retire in their 60s, and, but we need alternatives for people. And most people are not gonna have enough money to retire if they're going to have a much longer lifespan than the average age of. That's why retirement was, and Social Security benefits, as I'm sure you all know, were set at age 65 because life expectancy was in the 60s. So um, that doesn't work anymore, that equation. So we need to rethink work. And to rethink work, um, we need to rethink education because education is going to have, every child should be in, uh, in, in, introduced to the fact that they're lifelong learners and that they're gonna be in and out of education, not always in a formal setting, but perhaps in more informal settings. That's, those are two big topics that can be addressed now because we kind of know some of the changes that need to occur, but we need um, more critical mass behind it. Um, financial literacy um, becomes very important and digital literacy becomes very important. I, I visited a country last year that has a national campaign for digital literacy for people over 50. And this was an interesting concept. And they're paying for it. And they're, and they're introducing it at the municipalities. The, the concept being, you cannot have successful longevity unless you're digitally literate. Because that's how you're going to get a lot of your health care through telemedicine. You're going to be ordering your medications, or your food, or your shopping, or your banking. is all going to be online. And you can't rely on the grandchild to teach you what you need to do next. So they have, a from, from 50 on, paid for by their government, a national digital literacy campaign for all people, not once, but multiple times. Those are solutions that we don't think about with longevity, but really could make a huge difference in the lives of mass population. That will affect um, income as well over time. Um, so that financial literacy and digital literacy become two sort of messages you could take forth right now and introduce in schools. Only seven states in the country mandate financial literacy being taught in high schools. California, it turns out, is not one of them, which shocked me, one of the largest states. Um, you can't have successful aging if you don't have enough money to age. Um, and part of that is understanding financial literacy. So those are two that you wouldn't think of, but they're, they're very much public health kind of initiatives that need to occur to bring our country up to speed that some other countries are already engaging in. So those are some. So, uh, you know, we live life one day at a time. What you have to realize is the phenomenon of population aging is not the same as life extension. Population aging is a demographic phenomenon that is happening extraordinarily fast. And a lot of people don't realize that this is a tectonic shift in the age structure of our species. It's just not a, it's not one of these things that, that, that we see on a day-to-day -day basis, but over the next 20 years, there is gonna be a dramatic shift in the proportion of the population that survives to older ages. 
we're not prepared for it. Many folks, and this is, we had this discussion last night as we were preparing for this session, uh, anywhere in the world, developed country, developing country, we are simply not prepared for these extended lives uh, that we're experiencing and the, and the consequences of these extended lives. And I, I, and I gave a, a talk at AARP, and I know my, my friends at AARP have been very attuned to communicating this lack of preparation um, that, uh, for this aging population that is, uh, that is about to happen. So I, I, I think recognizing that this is going on um, in the background behind what we do on a day-to-day -day basis in living our longer lives is, is critical. Preparing for that is important. Recognizing that, that there has to be an adaptation to these aging bodies. Uh, you know, if we're gonna make it out routinely into our 80s uh, and 90s, many, many people will. This is a new phenomenon uh, we've never seen in, in human history to the level that we're, we're seeing now. And uh, a lot of people just, uh, I mean, I even have some very close friends that just are not prepared for the, the number of years that they're gonna be living in uh, retirement. And by the way, I noticed we have about 28 minutes left and I promise you, this will be opened up for questions because I know that there have to be a lot of burning questions in the audience. And there's no such thing as a bad question, by the way. Well, I'm the moderator. I get to decide that. <laughs> um, uh, yes, I'm going to ask a couple more and, and uh, just to, to try to uh, pull this a little bit together, and then we'll definitely open it up to all of you. Um, we just did an issue in health affairs on the workforce for community-based care for, a, for a, a population with growing illness. And you don't have to read the issue. Many of us have lived it in our lives of how much we're just sort of left on our own to navigate finding the help we need for ourselves or family members who need care. Um, I think about uh, extended retirement and, and the trends have all been towards individual responsibility. We've moved from sort of you know, defined benefit to defined contribution plans. Uh, the, the role that things like Social Security plays uh, shrink and shrink. So forgive my, I, I, I'm gonna, my last question will be a positive one, but I have to ask sort of my last kind of negative one, which is, you know, the public health model of here's the problem, the population that we're observing, here are the things we need to fix. You've all given us a long list of things to fix, but what I observe is a lot of the world, a lot of our country going the opposite direction of expecting these problems to be solved at the individual level rather than the collective level. So my question to you is, you've, you've raised these systems that need to change, and mostly my, my observation would be we're, we're telling people, you deal with it individually. How do we, what advice would you give to people in the room or how would you approach the question of where do we start with some sort of collective effort to modify systems to uh, support people with a, a longer health span? I would start at the community level. I'm a, a real believer that um, it's easier to make change in a smaller uh, geographic location first and wherever your community is, um, mobilize and it, it becomes almost a movement and, and, it, and it, 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 there was a movement started like this you might have heard of the village movement that got started in Boston where people wanted to continue to age thrive in their own homes um, but they needed assistance and they found each other and they there, there is now um, a connection where they share resources um, and drive each other to appointments and now this is being replicated in cities and towns and villages all over the United States but you could do that not just for that particular stage of life. And I'd, I'm a big believer that it's stage, not age, because you might be at that stage in your 40s and you might be at that stage in your 80s, depending on your personal life situation. But don't do this alone. It is too hard. Um, find people who have, have like-minded, like values, and it might be out of the community center that you visit or your local uh, religious organization or club or where, wherever, but you need community and find your community, and you have to find your community at different points, and mobilize and share resources, just like you did when you were raising your kids. Nobody could, you know, you needed somebody to do carpool with you or take a kid to the doctor. You couldn't always be there at all times. You can't do this alone. There's a lot to navigate. And learn together. I think there should be learning groups about this. There's a, too much information you have to master to have successful aging. And if you get to the, the part where you're in more of the complicated 
where you're taking care of somebody, you're getting a PhD in caregiving and nobody's teaching you how to do that. And it's not the same as taking care of children, having done it myself. Children get more and more independent. An older person most often gets more and more dependent. And you're usually in crisis management. You can't plan for it. The book I relied on when I was raising my babies were what to expect, you know, you're, when you're expecting what to expect your first year. There is no such equivalent for aging because it differs and it, it, it's not particularly predictable. So becoming informed, you can't become the expert in everything, but a group of you, a community of you, could become an expert in something and tap into the resources. And I think you can make change in your local settings that enhance your um, living. In my particular neighborhood, there's like five or six families that we regularly are connected to, and we've already said we're going to help each other age in place. We want to thrive in our community, and this is something we're thinking about. You need to be thinking about it um, earlier, you know, fr from the beginning, depending on where you're going to uh, be. But engage your community, and I think you can make substantial change. So Jay, I'm going to ask you to, so that we reserve enough time for the folks in the audience. You know, the baby boom generation has led to huge cultural and institutional shifts. When you think about the 30-year gift, and we looked over the next 20 years, it's that generation that's living the gift. Paint us a picture of what's the potential here. Oh, wow, all right. Um, I hate to end this way, but look, um, the baby boom generation is not doing well. Um, I, I, we may have actually published this in your journal, if I recall correctly. Uh, the health status of those born between 1946 and 1964 is not as good as the generation that preceded them and probably not as good as the generation that followed them. Obesity uh, has contributed to this quite dramatically, the rise of diabetes and so forth. So this particular cohort is not doing well. And actually, we did publish this in Health Affairs, where we made a prediction back in uh, 2011 that this generation was going to experience an increased risk of uh, stroke, cardiovascular disease. It happened, as you know. Uh, as they move through the age structure. So we have to recognize the different cohorts based on when you were born and the conditions that you lived during the course of your life has a profound influence on uh, your prospects for survival going late. So the baby boom generation is not doing well. I don't know about the, uh, the generation following them. I don't know all the details. Maybe we'll send you a paper on that uh, later, but um, that cohort is not, is not doing well. And, and if I could comment real briefly on this last sure. question that you raised, because I just had two points to make. One is control what you can control, uh, which is diet and exercise. This, is, this works. Uh, diet and exercise is the only equivalent of a fountain of youth that exists today. Stay away from all of these nonsensical uh, you know, interventions that are being sold by an industry that claims that they have a way to, to slow down, stop, or reverse your aging. None of it's true. Uh, there's no scientific evidence to back it up. So control what you can control through diet and exercise. And then in the world of biology, there's uh, an enormous amount of, of uh, effort that's going into this concept of slowing down the biological process. There's a lot of money flowing into this. It's very exciting to see this. If you have any way to participate, to contribute, to follow it, keep track of it, because this, I think, is the wave of the future. Great. Okay, we have some time for you all to join in. Uh, let's get a microphone so that everyone can hear you. We'll take a few. I see some hands up and go ahead. Hi, Scott Friedheim. Um, you talked uh, twice about a new model where it's less reactive, it's less disaggregated. Can you just hum a few more bars, open our minds a little bit to a new model that isn't disaggregated if you've come up with a framework or a heuristic, if you could talk about it, that'd be really interesting. Yeah, so I would encourage you to take a look at the, there was a National Geographic special that came out uh, that was narrated by Ron Howard a couple of years ago called The Age of Aging. I think, I think that was the title, and I'd watch that because you're gonna get to see myself and several other scientists meeting with uh, representatives from the Food and Drug Administration, from the FDA, where we develop a, a research model on how it is that you would go forth with a research project to attack the biological process of aging. So keep in mind, um, 
the FDA operates right now one disease, one treatment, uh, uh, one treatment, one disease. And what we're proposing is one treatment, uh, multiple disease endpoints. So just to give you an example, one area that's being pursued very aggressively now is uh, the testing of uh, metformin. Uh, metformin is, a, is being used to treat diabetes. It has side effects. The side effects appear to be positive. So we're now making a determination of whether or not this is a potential therapeutic intervention for aging. Senolytic compounds, these are compounds that are being tested uh, at the Mayo Clinic and elsewhere uh, that have the potential to slow down the, the biological process. So we're talking about therapeutic interventions that would be introduced into our bodies that would have the systemic effect of slowing down all uh, systems associated with aging. Now keep in mind, it's already happening biologically. So if some of you are in the room are over 100, I don't know, it's sort of hard to tell, but if you are over 100 or you're, you're close to it, chances are you are experiencing a decelerated rate of biological aging within your own body. Jeanne Calmon, the 122-year-old woman, is probably an example of somebody who experienced decelerated aging. Biological time ticks at a slower rate for her. All we're trying to do is find a way to, to introduce the slower ticking of our clock to the rest of us, and it's probably going to be some sort of therapeutic intervention, and that's the science that's being aggressively pursued now. Uh, if we can get the microphone way up here in the front row. I'm, oh, so, okay, I'll let you guide because I can't see as well with the lights. Right. Thanks. Uh, thank you. First, uh, Susan, uh, since my wife and I are a few years older than you, if your neighbors put up any other houses for sale, we'd like to get in on the mutual support deal. <laughs> Uh, but I have a question about uh, demographics, the inequality of uh, life expectancy. Uh, men live nearly five years less on average than women in this country. Uh, if that were reversed, I assume there'd be a, a national crisis. Uh, but is anything being addressed to close that gap? From a, a gender standpoint? Yes. I'm, I'm not aware of that, but I think that the, from a public health standpoint, the, the disparity was because men were more likely to smoke, um, and uh, that was one of their higher risk factors for a long time. Um, I don't know if smoking cessation rates have changed dramatically among uh, men compared to women. Women were less likely to start smoking. Um, diet and exercise was part of it, but I don't know, you might have yeah, more Yeah, uh, the gap won't close. Uh, I, I mean, I wish I could say otherwise, but it's not going to happen. Uh, females, on average, live longer by roughly five years, just about everywhere in the world. You see it across species. Um, it's just an advantage that females have. Exactly understanding exactly why that occurs, it's likely to be a basic biological phenomenon. But I don't see us closing that gap. Uh, and 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 by the way, um, women at older ages have higher levels of frailty and disability in part because they live longer. They're living into these age windows where frailty and disability is higher. So I don't see it eliminating. And at age 65, the gap is about two and a half years, just so you're, you're aware. So the gap shortens the longer, the longer we live. Thank you. Yeah, it's better this way. You talked about diet and exercise. Uh, how about sleep and other factors? Yeah, no question. There's a, I mean, there's a broad range of variables that influence our health and quality of life. Sleep is absolutely critical uh, because the absence of sleep, as you know, leads to this cascading uh, set of negative consequences. So I, I just mentioned a, a couple. There's a whole, I mean, there's a, a, a whole suite uh, of things. I, I, I would also, because this is probably going to come up, everybody always asks about nutritional supplements of so, some sort of magical elixir. I'm going to be frank. Uh, the vast majority of people that are taking nutritional supplements thinking that it's going to, you know, radically extend their life, they, they really just have expensive urine. Um, and that's all it's, it's producing. Uh, you know, eating food. Uh, uh, is probably the best approach. I know this is going to come up, but. So how many hours of sleep? There's a person over 60. The, yeah, the question was how many hours of sleep. Look, it's going to vary from one, from one person to another. Some people can get by with five hours of sleep. Some people need eight hours, but, but that sleep is, is um, absolutely critical. I will mention one thing, by the way. Um, 
a personal story. Uh, so I, I had to start taking a compound called finasteride for BPH. The, the biggest effect was uh, sleep. All of a sudden, I wasn't getting up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom anymore. Suddenly, I was getting seven or eight hours of sleep, and my cognitive functioning uh, improved dramatically. So sometimes these simple compounds that we're taking for, for, uh, for health problems can have, a cast, can have a, an effect on other elements uh, of, of body functioning, that being one of them. So we're going to go here, here, and I'm pretty sure at that point we'll be out of time. So. Well, thanks for your comments. I am a medical director of a hospice and a medical oncologist. And as I listened to you, I took a lot of notes because I thought what you had to say was, was terrific. But I've personally been involved in the community where we impact our community, and it's been incredibly fulfilling on a personal basis. But when you talk about democratizing healthcare, social determinants, um, inequality, um, disparity of care, financial and digital literacy, these seem like big policy changes to me. These don't think, seem like things that an individual, unless you're an Aspen, can actually accomplish. And I'm curious your opinions on socialized medicine or, or care for all. Because when I take care of my patients in the hospice setting, the families don't have resources. Some of the places that they live and die are appalling and the resources don't exist. And so I'm just kind of curious, curious about your opinion on policy and universal health care. So I'm going to take the prerogative of the moderator and not turn this into a session about universal health care. But I do think the, the issue raised does lend itself to some great response from both of you on what elements of what needs to change are most amenable to, to this sort of collective action that's beyond the community level. I mean, in the perfect world, yes, I wish we had resources on a national level for every single community. I was being more of a realist, saying we're not going to be able to get that right now. Um, so how do we make change on, on a smaller scale and then mul become the multiplier effect? Um, some, we, we won't be able to change it all, but, there, but my point was we, we have some knowns. We have knowns that work. And how do we disseminate that and get that to people quicker? And my, my view from what I've seen is that doing it on a smaller scale first helps rather than trying to make vast policy changes that will f affect 350 million people. It's just harder. It would be great as the goal. Um, but if we could demonstrate success, like if we were to take a state, one, uh, Massachusetts is doing great things on, on, a, on a statewide level and then disseminating it in, on the community level. We could can replicate that in different places. That would be fantastic. Can you say what it is that Massachusetts is doing? So that's they, they have a whole healthy aging network, and they they are thinking about healthy aging on all levels in all their townships in their cities with the state um, government involved in um, bringing the resources to them. They're doing the thinking and they're doing the disseminating on the community and level. And I think I think it's uh, extremely interesting. So that's why I was trying to um, segment it, because one of our states equals some of the other countries that I was mentioning that can do this. And that's why I think it's so, so much more complicated. So uh, briefly, look, I'm from Chicago. Uh, I, I was at the University of Chicago for years. If you're on the north side of the Midway Plaisance, your life expectancy is very high. If you're on the south side of the Midway Plaisance, your life expectancy is uh, much lower. I don't know how easy it's going to be to deal with those, those types of, of disparities, but it's, I mean, basic, just even access to basic public health is fundamentally different across the street. And I, I, I don't know how to fix that. I just re I really have no idea. So I'm going to, we're going to have to do this real quick because I want people to have time to get down into uh, to, to the subsequent sessions. But quick question, quick answer. Okay, several of the things that you mentioned for healthy aging involved large measure of personal responsibility, diet, exercise, sleep. Not so easy to motivate people to make those changes in their lives. Have you found something that generally resonates better to, uh, than others to motivate people to make the considerable effort to adapt those healthy habits? I guess Dr. Olshansky. Yeah, boy, that is a great That's question. A question. Um, and I have a really short answer. N no. <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm, I, I, I wish I did. 
I said I, quick questions, quick answers. You got what? I got exactly. It's a great right. question. It is a great question, and it's a topic that will come up in other sessions. Well, uh, with that, uh, please join me in thanking Susan and Jay. We hope we've answered some of your questions, left you with some good thoughts, and uh, we are adjourned. <laughs>